Next week is Pentecost, one of the great festivals of the Christian Church, which commemorates the time when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples of Jesus in Jerusalem. Without that, there would be no Christian faith or church. But Pentecost itself couldn't have happened without the ascension of Jesus. And so today we're going to consider the ascension and what it means. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Eternal and gracious God, grant that as we believe in your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to have ascended with triumph into your kingdom in heaven, so may we also in heart and mind ascend to where he is, and with him continually dwell, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Thank you. 
ascension of Jesus into heaven is a watershed in the Gospel account. For 40 days beforehand, Jesus had been giving his disciples an intensive Bible study to open their understanding to the global significance of what had happened. Then, for 10 days after the ascension, the disciples stayed in Jerusalem, waiting. Praying, praising and worshipping, but above all, waiting, as they had been told to do. Then came the day of Pentecost and the gift of the Holy Spirit, leading to the dramatic birth and rapid growth of the Church, as described in Acts. But what is the significance of the Ascension? It doesn't fall on a Sunday, so we can almost let it pass by without noticing. There are three accounts of the Ascension. Neither Matthew nor John record it, though John does have Jesus refer to it during his encounter with Mary Magdalene in the garden. Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mark has a brief but significant paragraph. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Luke, however, has two accounts, one at the end of his Gospel and one at the beginning of Acts. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. So the last glimpse we have of Jesus in Luke's Gospel is of Jesus blessing his disciples as he is taken from them, leaving them in joyful worship. We'll turn to Luke's second account of the Ascension, and that's in the book of Acts. In chapter 1, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of forty days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. There are several things to note in this account. First, it's very much an eyewitness report, with an emphasis on what they saw. He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Artists throughout the centuries since have attempted to capture what happened and have failed. We simply can't imagine or visualise the event in a satisfactory way. 
But Jesus didn't just stop appearing to the disciples, leaving them in limbo. They were left in no doubt that Jesus had gone from the earth for good. And he left them instructions to wait for the next event, the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Second, the ascension is linked to the second coming of Jesus. A comparison. A cloud hid him from their sight. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. This association with clouds reminds us of the scene in Daniel, where a glorious victor is received. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Private and low-key, just the eleven disciples. Public and glorious. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. To be followed by mission, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. To be followed by the final establishment of God's universal kingdom. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. And a third point. During the 40 days following his resurrection, Jesus spoke to them about the kingdom of God, which was a strong theme in Luke's gospel. We pray regularly in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. What do we mean? What did Jesus mean? The disciples thought he was talking about their own nation and the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. It was a natural question, given their strong sense of national identity. With our perspective, we might think they still hadn't quite got it, that the kingdom of God was not just about Israel, or indeed any earthly kingdom, but about the rule of God throughout the world. But the day of Pentecost, ten days afterwards, 
must have shown them that they needed to broaden their thinking and the conversion of Cornelius a bit later on with the gift of the Holy Spirit and the growth of Gentile churches everywhere completely changed their outlook. And so today we are in the middle of the global ecumenical prayer movement called Thy Kingdom Come. This invites Christians around the world to pray from Ascension to Pentecost for more people to come to know Jesus Christ. It's a movement which started in 2016 and it unites more than a million Christians in prayer in nearly 90% of the countries across the world, across 85 different denominations and traditions. Every person, every household and every church is encouraged to pray during these 11 days that friends, family, neighbours and colleagues might come to faith in Jesus Christ and we are specifically invited to pray for five people known to us who have not yet responded to God's call. So what is the relevance of the Ascension for us today? To return to Mark's account, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. What is he doing there? First, he is reigning. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 tells us, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Majesty in heaven. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, overcomer of sin, death and Satan, sustainer of the universe, King of kings and Lord of lords, is now crowned with glory and honour. When we pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we acknowledge that God's purpose is to bring about a new creation in the fullness of time. Second, he is interceding for us. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus' death has won us freedom. His resurrection has won us life. His ascension has given us an advocate. Not that the Son has to plead with the Father on our behalf, no, he confronts our accuser, Satan, and points to the cross on which he cancelled all our debts. And it's not only the Son who is supporting us in the throne room of heaven. The Spirit also intercedes on our behalf by interpreting our inarticulate prayers. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So the whole of the Trinity is involved in supporting us from heaven on earth. If God is for us, who indeed can be against us? The Incarnation, the Crucifixion, the Resurrection, the Ascension... Pentecost. These are the great events in the salvation plan of God. The next will be the return of Jesus Christ and the renewal of all things. Like the apostles, we wait in expectation, hope, prayer and worship for that day.
Jesus Christ ascended to his heavenly throne, intercedes for us, and through him we bring our prayers. For the church from out the world, and in our own localities, that we may be a witness to the truth. For the world in all its troubles and brokenness, we long for peace, the peace that will truly come when your kingdom has come. For those in need, distress or sorrow, from illness, bereavement, the problems of life, and we think of those known to us. We pray for the fulfilment of all that Jesus began in his earthly ministry, for the reconciling of mankind and all creation to God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
May the risen and ascended Christ fill our hearts and those for whom we pray, today and every day. Amen. <laughs>